we have as a final session what should I'm looking forward to is an absolutely delightful conversation and I want to simply introduce the person who will, who will organize the conversation, a person who needs no introduction and therefore I will spend no time introducing him, uh, William Perry, Bill Perry. <laughs> Uh, th thank you, Jim. Every president since President Eisenhower has proclaimed that the United States' energy dependence was a national security problem, and we should do everything we can to eliminate that dependence. And every president since President Eisenhower had presided over a decrease in that dependence. That's just a historical fact. But what may be that may be about to change with the uh, fracking revolution in particular in the last few number of years it seems to be turning around. So if you modify the proposal to be energy independence for North America, not just the United States, and if you define independence not to mean we don't buy any oil, but we buy less energy than we sell, then that's pro I think that's an attainable goal in five to 10 years. So I have a few questions to ask my two colleagues here. The first is, is, is that a reasonable statement of the problem, namely North American energy independence as I defined it in five to 10 years? If so, then what is the economic value of that position? How does that change our economy, economics? And secondly, what is the, what is the security value? Does it really improve our security. And let me start off with the security first and turn to Jeff on that one. Do you think it, we do have a security problem because of our energy dependence? And do you think removing that dependence or decreasing that independence improves our security? Well, I, I think we have a security problem because of our dependence on petroleum. Because I do think that our markets are subject to disruption and, and our economy is subject to uh, substantial disruption because of what happens in the, in the oil markets mm -hmm. of the world. Uh, and I think it's, it's great. I think there's some su substantial benefits to reducing our imports of oil and uh, getting to a point where we are perhaps a net exporter of, of energy or petroleum. But as long as we are dependent on petroleum and as we are today, uh, that, that security problem continues to a very substantial extent. So, so we, we haven't solved the problem, the, the total problem. We, we've, we partially solved our, our current balance of payments with, with the rest of the world if we re dramatically reduce our imports, but we have not solved our security problems. That'd be my take on it. Uh, Steve, would you comment on the, first of all, the five to 10 years being a reasonable goal, secondly, economic impact, and third, the security impact, any of those? Sure, uh, first, um, let me do in reverse order. The security, there are two parts of the security. One is um, uh, the security having to do with an interruption of supply. Uh, if there's unrest in the Middle East and, and something, uh, some key strait is mined, this is an interruption of supply that scares a lot of countries. Um, and then there's the, and that's an issue. Uh, we actually get less and less oil from the Middle East, but it's still an issue because um, oil ships very easily around the world. And because of that, uh, if there's an interruption of supply of other countries, you've, you see an impact. And we see impacts there, and it's more on the financial side, uh, the volatility and the nervousness uh, of, of that is, is another issue. Having North American, your point about uh, North American energy independence, I think is a very real possibility, not so much the United States, but North America, Canada, US, Mexico. Um, it won't relieve the price volatility of oil because it, it, it is an international issue uh, because oil ships so easily. Uh, it could certainly relieve some of the supply issues, uh, 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 interruption of supply. And so I think um, 
now the and the question is we are blessed with a lot of fossil fuels in North America. We are blessed with a lot of land and sun and wind in North America as well. And if you consider that plus all the other things, for example, the trading of energy across borders, uh, we're beginning to do this with Canada uh, and hydro and actually can actually start to trade and think of trading energy and using hydro storage. And so these, there are tremendous opportunities there where if you look at North America as a whole and not each country separately, there are a great deal of opportunities that we're just beginning to scratch the surface mm -hmm. of the, that we should think about. Now, a, a major factor in this progress in the last decade has been the fracking revolution, first with natural gas and now with oil as well. And here my question is, what could this be upset by an event like, a, could we have a TMI, Three Mile Island type event? Some ecological disaster which causes a stop, at least a dramatic slowdown. With that thought in mind, what could be done to minimize that probability? Is it we talk about more regulation? Then if regulation, is it a state regulation or federal regulation? How do we go about that approach? Jeff, will give you a crack at that first. What about the regulatory issue? Well, uh, Secretary Chu uh, had a commission which uh, did a very good report, I thought, uh, back to him and to the Congress and everyone, uh, talking about the whole issue of fracking and horizontal drilling and, and, uh, and, the economic and the environmental impacts. And we had a hearing and brought those folks uh, to tell us what they concluded. My recollection, and uh, Steve can, can correct me on this, but my recollection was that they said the uh, problem of, of spills, uh, polluting groundwater, was, uh, was a problem with all oil and gas drilling, but it was not a, some, fracking did not add to it that substantially, except that fracking, of course, is causing us to do a lot more drilling, that the real, economic, or the real environmental issue was the release of methane and that uh, this was something which did require additional regulation and which uh, I understand the EPA is looking at now as something that they are going to try to regulate more effectively than they have in the past. Do you have a view of the relative importance of state versus federal regulation in this area? Well, to the extent that the federal government uh, will step up and do it, it will be more effective, in my view. Steve? Well, in uh, the eastern part of the United States, first, uh, a lot of the drilling, uh, the horizontal drilling, the fracking in the eastern part of the United States are in private lands. Then, so it, it's out of the formal purview of the federal government. It's, it's the state regulatory agencies. However, I will agree with Jeff that on federal lands, especially in the western part of the United States, the U.S. government should step in and develop a set of standards and ever increasing better standards as the technology gets better uh, so that uh, this resource can be extracted uh, in the safest way possible. Um, I would say that the through my, through my island, Fukushima, or whatever you want to use as an example, if a major water table does become contaminated, in a major sort of way, that would have a profound impact on, on how you, you know, the, a lot of states and a lot of communities will say no more. And so in, in the study we were doing, and when we were doing this, and, and as you well know, because uh, he was the chair of the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, and there was a subcommittee that was doing this, so he was asking uh, a question he knew the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> he knows the answer to all these questions. Yes, don't, don't let him fool you. <laughs> but in any case, um, uh, I think what the commission, the study also recommended is please adopt best practices. Uh, yes, you need regulatory authority, but industry should also step forward and say, hey, don't, don't, don't kill the, this goose. Yeah. And, and, and there are a lot of best practices that one could adopt to, to mitigate a lot of the risks. <clears throat> the fugitive emission is an issue, um, not a completely, you know, the monitoring of this, all these things, the, the baselining before you start of water tables, all, all very important things. 
Long before it becomes mandatory, I would hope that industry would step forward and say, we're going to do this. Uh, because what they should not want is a ecological mishap that's significant that could really mm. s stop this. Right? Yeah. Okay, so, so I think uh, one tries to get the industry to, to step up the plate uh, to, to do this uh, partly on their own, but they still need a regulatory push without a doubt, and I think the federal government is in a good position to, to set those standards. Is the uh, self-regulation within the nuclear industry a good analogy for that, do you think? Uh, well, it's partly self-regulated, and partly we have the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and so they keep the, the industry honest. But I think the uh, U.S. nuclear industry, especially after Three Mile Island, recognized that this, you know, anything, and with Three Mile Island, there were no deaths. There, were no, there was a very insignificant amount of radiation that leaked out, it turned out. It's less than one per, in the 10 mile radius around, it's less than mm -hmm. a tenth of a percent of, of background. Uh, Fukushima, entirely different story. Okay, and, and you saw what a profound impact Fukushima had on many countries' attitudes towards uh, nuclear energy. And so, so, you, mm. re, so the nuclear industry in the U.S. is pretty good, but they also have the NRC. You, the, <laughs> Steve, this morning, you gave, I thought, a very eloquent uh, statement about the importance of solar energy. Um, the question I want to get to is, how long is it going to take to get solar energy to a significant scale? You can define significant however you like, a significant scale in terms of a supply of electricity in the United States. And when that happens, will American industry have a significant part be a, play a significant role in the supply of that, those solar energy, as you see the tr things trending today? I'll define significant as at least 10 percent. Okay. Um, we're, in the U.S., we're about 10 percent all renewables, of which 6 percent is hydro. And most of the other is currently wind, uh, but, but <clears throat> solar is getting into the 1 percent range now. Uh, I would hope in the next decade, it gets into the, by itself, gets into the 10 percent or higher range, um, especially as the costs come down dramatically and you get rid of these, figure out the solution to solve costs. Also, the energy storage uh, will be a major part of that. Uh, you know, I, I would love to see um, renewables be 50 percent of our electricity generation or uh, by you know, 20 or 30 years from today. That, you know, I would love to see nuclear continuing uh, uh, this century. I think by the middle end of this century, I hope we don't need it anymore. Uh, but uh, we, unless we move in this direction, you know, we have a serious mm -hmm. risk of uh, some adverse climate change. So now. I think it needs new business models. As I was discussing, if you can get the utility companies and the regulators to embrace, hey, there's a profitable way of doing this, which instead of being scared of solar, it becomes their growth industry. Uh, because, and I know enough about the utilities and talk to them where they would love to have, especially on the energy storage side, in-building energy storage in a distributed way. They would love that. And so if they make that part of this business plan, uh, then I could see it taking off because instead of getting scared and beginning to fight it, they, they embrace it as a growth industry where it becomes at least as profitable as, as uh, you know, building a new gas plant. So I think when you get things like that and you get over those humps, then you can really see it take off because then it, uh, interests are aligned. And, and, and so, you know, in the last year I was Secretary of Energy, I started to try to talk to the utility companies, the regulators, and say, this is a real opportunity of a completely different business model. In the time scale when solar becomes 10 to 20 percent of electricity, in that time scale, what other renewable energies do you think hold the most promise? Well, wind and solar uh, hold the most promise uh, with wind, uh, 
in certain countries around the world. Uh, uh, now, I don't, what I mean by wind, let's say if you look at Ireland, which is about 10% wind by generation, uh, the Iberian Peninsula is about 20% wind and solar. I'm picking those examples because they have very small ties to the rest of the world. Uh, if you're Denmark, it doesn't really matter because you have you know, a access to conventional electricity. For the, but if you're an island or you're more isolated, mm -hmm. then it becomes, can you get self-sufficiency? And the, uh, the experiments are, they're not experiments. They really, you know, Ireland's 10% going, one and going 20, 25%. Mm -hmm. Great Britain wants to go to 25%. Iberian Peninsula wants to go even higher. And so we have existence proofs that, at least at that level, mm -hmm. you, you can manage this. And where you're, you're not tied into a bigger system that absorbs yeah. all the fluctuations. Go, let's go back to North America. It's an incredibly large area. With the right transmission systems, with the right trading things, with all these other things, even in the United States alone, there's an incredible opportunity. We, you know, we have fossil fuel energy resources, but we have renewable energy resources also come out of our years that we should take advantage of. And, the, and if you include all of North America, then it becomes very good. In the case of the solar, 10, 20 years from now, who's going to be making the solar panels? Well, I hope the United States goes back to making them big time. Um, I think uh, yeah, a lot of it depends on uh, a lot of things. What has happened over the last several years is there have been, as I said, exuberance of um, expectation and availability of very cheap capital, particularly in China, where uh, there was an overexpansion. And then you couple that with the recession, and all of a sudden there's an oversupply. That's going to work itself out. The price is still going to go down. As I said, if I, I look, I see at least 15 years of technological headroom where it's just going to march down in the electronics, in the distribution, uh, transmission systems, and in the panels themselves. And so um, now, the question is, OK, where is it going to be made? Um, the United States should be a major manufacturer. Um, if you consider where, as I mentioned briefly, most of the photovoltaic silicon that goes into the Chinese factories actually comes from the United States. Because the, uh, the, the companies that make silicon, photograde silicon in the United States have access to very inexpensive power, and it's very energy intensive. So we sh ship silicon to China. In an au highly automated factories in China, they dope it, they put on the electrodes, they do all this older stuff, okay? And then they ship it around the world. Consider another thing that also uh, you know, remember in the good old days with steel, you would, you would make the steel where there's coal uh, because the shipping of the coal, the transport of rail of coal is more expensive. Okay. Yeah, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I know all about that. Right. <laughs> the iron ore is easier to ship than the coal. So you ship, okay. Now, who are the, where do we buy a lot of our steel from? Asia, which to have neither the coal nor the steel. So China is buying coal from the United States. Korea, you know, they don't have coal. And Japan, they don't have coal. So they ship the coal. They don't have the iron ore. And they're able to make better, cheaper steel than us? What is wrong with this? And what is wrong with it is the US, for decades, did not retool and did not reinvest. OK, so, so for me to hear people say, oh, no, no, we can't, we can't capture back you know, steel manufacturing, it's gone crazy. So, can we, and so because we have a very inexpensive energy and great natural resources, surely we, you know, in highly automated plants, you know, it's, not, it's not the labor, but it's more important because even in highly automated plants, there's a whole supply chain for that plant that's usually domestically supplied. So in terms of jobs, it's not in the plant itself, it's in the supply chain and all the secondary and tertiary jobs. And so we should be really looking hard at ourselves and saying, why can't we recapture steel manufacturing as well as solar? We should. Jeff, we'd like to weigh in on this, this whole issue. 
Well, I, I may uh, be somewhat cynical after hanging around Washington so long, but uh, my, my view is that uh, I agree we, we have the capability to regain a portion of the world market for manufacture of solar cells, but uh, unless we adopt policies to support that or, or to lead to that result, if the Chinese have policies to, to do that and the Germans have policies to do that and various other countries, then, then they're going to wind up manufacturing the solar cells. It's like they're going to wind up manufacturing the LEDs and, and uh, perhaps the batteries. Now, we've, we've put some, uh, as while, while uh, Steve was secretary, we, we did a lot to try to stimulate manufacture of batteries in this country. And uh, I hope very much that that will continue. But again, I think we've got to follow through with those policies in order that we not wind up buying all of our batteries from overseas as well, just like we may wind up buying all of our uh, uh, photovoltaic cells. Can I, can I, I, I agree with everything you said, Jeff. Um, you know, there's a myth going around that China was developing solar cells to sell to Germany, the rest of Europe, and the United States. Now, they started that way, but because of the continuing recession, especially in Europe, um, China is now, uh, in 2012, for 2013 for sure, will be the biggest market for renewable energy in the world, domestic China. Now, why are they doing this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. They want to keep their solar manufacturing, all those huge investments, those hundreds of billions of dollars, they want to keep that alive to get out of this oversupply, ride that, and, and they also actually are very concerned about climate change in their country. And so, but they, they see this as a, an, if you have a home market, which is to what Jeff was saying, a, a robust home market, that's the best thing you can do for manufacturing. But you, you want to make it in the United States to be used in the United States as well as the world market. And so China, China's um, um, willing to say, OK, we're going to start helping deployment of solar to ride, help them ride through this overproduction problem. And that's, you know, if you have to think about it, that, that makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, they just see this as an opportunity not only for their domestic market, but for the world market. And they make no bones about it. Let me uh, pivot over now to from supply to demand. And I commend all of you the remarkable speech that Steve gave this morning on the things that could be done in demand that could really make a, a, a great difference. I want to just pick up a few of those and talk about them a little bit. Uh, because of the fracking revolution, we have natural gas in bountiful supply and getting cheaper and cheaper. One of the potentials for that is to use it as a fuel for vehicles, in particular for trucks. All of the calculations I've seen say it makes a lot of sense for trucks to be using natural gas for fuel. There's sort of a chicken and egg problem, though, that they're not going to use it until they get gas stations along the freeways. And the, and the uh, country companies are reluctant to build those gas stations and so see, they see enough trucks. So it's a standard chicken and egg problem. Is there a role for government in breaking that, you know, getting that log jam broken and get, get it moving? The outcome will be a, fr a free market bonanza, but how do you get to that outcome? And I'll first Steve and then to Jeff. Yeah. What, what can the government do to get that moving fast? Well, let me f first tell what the federal government is doing or wants to do. Um, if you take a, and we're talking about long haul trucks. These are the 18 wheelers. The average distance the long haul trucks drive is about 100,000 miles a year. And they get about five or six miles to a gallon of diesel. OK, so that's a lot of money, all right? 100,000 miles, divide by five, let's say, uh, and, and so there's 20,000 gallons, but you multiply by five the other way, so it's $100,000 a year just for fuel. And um, if you take those, the same internal combustion engine, can be retrofitted, and not even, and the newer ones are, will be optimized better, uh, and it already makes good sense, as you well know from your CAP. 
here. These, he's, these are all loaded questions. He knows the answers. To these them. are all leading <laughs> questions, you understand. <laughs> uh, but but um, it already makes good sense. And so what, now with trucks, uh, to retrofit a truck, it, they sometimes would charge, or even to build you know, a new truck out of the assembly, like a, you know, a Mack truck or Kenilworth, the truck itself is $100,000, and they're charging up to another $100,000 to put in the, uh, the gas handling system and the liquefied containers. Now, what should it cost? About $30,000, all right? But if you build new, it, 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 it's not gonna be that much more. Um, and so, as you begin to do this, the first thing you wanna do is get enough competition out there, at least at several manufacturers, so the price should never be, it shouldn't, today it shouldn't be 100,000, and most it should be 50. And just get it down to 50, 30, 20,000 dollars, and all of a sudden, you know, at that price point, you know, you're paying for yourself in one year. I mean, the cost of liquefied natural gas, including shipping, and a few central stations in the United States, uh, still looks to be two or three times cheaper, okay? Uh, now, Shell, I don't know where their program is now. They were going to invest about $300 million in stations. in stations around the United States, and there's another consortium of companies that were going to do it in more in localized areas. But if you look at the map of the United States, there's some major interstates, and you need a station about every, the range is five or 600 miles. You need a, a fueling station every 100, 150 miles to get from the edge of one city to the edge of another city. And, and so it's not like a personal vehicle where you have to have lots of them. So, and so the, uh, the trucking industry, heavy duty trucking industry is 20% of our energy of transportation. It's big. And if you do these interstates and the maps that I've seen, uh, you can get half of that. So that's a significant savings, but it's, it's the economics already look very, very good. And so the administration is proposing, let's help, you know, if, if someone wants to spend the extra 50 or $80,000, we'll pay for a certain amount up to that, and then just to nudge it forward, and to keep companies like, you know, Shell and others to invest. Uh, because that would do a lot, again, for energy independence, you know, offloading oil, which is, I see it mostly, prices mostly going up, whereas gas I see as being stable for the next couple of decades. Well, so, the market system is going to make this happen sooner or later. The question is how do we make it sooner rather than later? Yeah. Jeff, what's your view on that? Well, I, I think S Steve's given a lot of uh, good information there about what, uh, what is, <laughs> is happening. And I think to the extent that the government can uh, step in and partner with uh, uh, with the private sector to, to accelerate this, so we certainly should. I, I'm encouraged that uh, you can buy a Ram uh, pickup now that uh, is, is equipped with both uh, natural gas uh, fueling capability as well as, as gasoline. And uh, that, that's, to me, a, a substantial step forward. And I hope that there gets to be competition between various manufacturers in this country uh, even at that level, uh, because uh, there, there are a lot of fleets of pickups mm -hmm. that uh, are in operation around the country that could be using natural gas that are, that are stuck with uh, gasoline right now. Yeah, by the way, that technology has a huge advantage when you're at the delivery truck or personal vehicle level, because you could have, it's sort of like a plug-in hybrid. You can run a natural gas if you're there, but you don't have the anxiety that if you ever got stranded. With a today's modern engine, you could, a direct injection engine, you could you know, flip the computer and the computer says, okay, my feed is now natural gas, little natural gas tank, go the first 40 miles. Flip it, my feed is now gasoline. And so this, this is technology that exists. It isn't deployed quite, it's beginning to be. And that becomes very exciting because uh, natural gas is going to be a lot less expensive in the U.S. than oil and diesel and gasoline. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one concrete example. I, uh, I was having lunch with the mayor of a small town in New Mexico, Socorro, New Mexico. Some of you probably know Socorro. 
uh, where New Mexico Tech is located. And the mayor was complaining that the city is the natural gas utility, and the city was trying to figure out how it could use its own natural gas to operate its own fleet of repair vehicles and, and city vehicles around there. And he said the cost was prohibitive of trying to get these things retrofitted. And so when, uh, when Dodge came out with their, their uh, truck that allowed for natural gas usage, uh, I called him up and said, you know, this is, this is a reasonably priced vehicle that will allow you to do what you need to do. And, and as far as I know, they're, they're following through on it. Yeah. But, but there's a lot of opportunity for, for the use of natural gas in the transportation sector that we haven't exploited mm -hmm. yet. Well, those of you who are new to this area, if you've been driving around campus, around Palo Alto, you discover a profusion of hybrid cars, Priuses and others. In fact, you'll see a lot of Priuses. You'll see a few Teslas. The Tesla uh, showroom is just about, about a mile or two from here. And you'll see a few of the kind of cars I drive, which is a plug-in hybrid. And the question that I'm going to ask these two is, what is the future in more economical automobiles? Is it hybrid, plug-in hybrid, all electric, or is there a fourth technology out there not yet on the market? Um, you know, really agnostic, <laughs> uh, you know, and it, it, but it's also, it's deeper than that because it really depends on your usage. If you're in a farm in the Midwest or West, you, range is a big deal for you. And, and so uh, an all electric is probably not going to do well, okay? You know, you really want to go three or 400 miles. Now, 10 years from today, you can maybe go 300 miles uh, in a $25,000 car. You know, Tesla's, you know, $75,000 or $82,000 for the Tesla S. But, but, we'll, but uh, so it, it really depends uh, on what you're going to use. In suburbia and cities, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that do work. Uh, you know, once you get above 150 or certainly 200 miles, uh, for city suburban driving, there's, there's, you know, there is some anxiety. I know some leaf owners have some anxiety at, at, at 100 miles, but, but uh, and so they have to think a little more, more deeply about their trips. But is there, is there anything in the diesel field which is going to be a competitor? Uh, in the diesel fuel, well, uh, natural gas uh, for heavier duty things. Um, in the medium duty. Things. One issue has to do with natural gas storage and the cost of the carbon tank, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, that's where R&D can do a lot of things. I, um, again, chemical fuel is, is really very high energy density. And despite the fact that the engines are only 35% or, or diesel maybe 40% efficient, uh, mm -hmm. it's such high energy density that it, the range is issue. But, but I don't know because maybe 15 years from now we get the battery that, you yeah. know, and, and then everything changes. Uh, so you just don't really know. I think you would just invest in all these things to see what happens. Invest in the research in all these things and let the private sector make investments. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with what uh, Steve is saying. I, I think that at the current, uh, the current state of technology development, the plug-in hybrid has a lot of attractions for people and in my part of the country where, where you may wind up having to drive over 100 miles uh, on, a, on a trip or, or during the day. Uh, I think that uh, all electric vehicles are getting better and better and, uh, and the cost is, uh, the cost of, mm -hmm. of getting that extended range is coming down. And so I think uh, uh, there's, there's potentially a great uh, opportunity there. But, at the current time, I think there's more of a market for plug-in hybrids like the one you're driving. I want to pivot to buildings. Although I must say, I, I do salivate over a Tesla S. <laughs> 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 that has enough range for me. <laughs> Pivoting now to buildings, uh, there's a huge potential to be realized in making buildings more efficient. And Steve touched on that this morning in his talks. And 
the question in my mind is how do we get more energy, that's a mis ambiguous word, how do we get more action by the people who build buildings, particularly industrial buildings, to build in these features that are energy saving. All of the mathematics I've seen on this suggest that the math is in favor of doing this. It, the payback period is very attractive, but yet it doesn't seem to be happening. What can we do to get some, something moving here? And does government in particular have an important role to play here? So again, Steve, I'll throw that question first to you and then to Steve. Well, yeah. first, I think the biggest, one of the biggest barriers, believe it or not, is uh, inertia and information. Um, many, many architects and structural engineers actually don't know what's available at no extra cost uh, and how you can save. And one of the things I started when I was director of Berkeley Lab, but pushed even harder, is how do, you, how do you get people aware of the existing technologies and even design tools that they can plug in? This, this is the concept of what you want. How can you put in something really simple like air ducts? Uh, right angles and air ducts, very, very bad. Uh, it costs a lot of energy to move around air. It has to go like that. But, but people, when they draw the air ducts, they use you know, right angles. Well, you know, it, it, when you're building a new building, it doesn't cost that. It doesn't cost more. The, the, very, very simple things. Having the ventilation system not fight convection is something that is not fully understood. You know, hot air rises, <laughs> uh, and and so you have profound examples, even in modern buildings built in the last five years, where. They just say, we're going to use energy and power to overcome natural convection, whereas you should be using natural convection to actually assist in the circulation. Now, we, have a, we just bought a home here in Menlo Park. It's a two-story home. Um, uh, it has no air conditioning. We don't need air conditioning. You open up the windows in the ground floor at night and let it cool on the top floor, and then you close the windows at 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. In, in the daytime, and your house stays at 70 or 68, or you name it. That's what's happening. And so that just the sensible use of what you have is something that most building designers have forgotten about below 200 years ago. And, and in Europe today, where they don't have much air conditioning, they know this stuff. So just even getting that stuff into the design of the buildings is, is profound. And it saves money, you know. Just not forcing against, you know, hot air rises, cold air sinks, just things like this. Passive shading. Uh, when the south and west facing sun on a hot day, use some white shades. Okay. And so uh, again, this is stuff that you can build in to the automated things. I <laughs> we'll go around and do this management myself. Uh, my wife won't do it, but you know, I will open the windows at night, close them during the day, <laughs> and do all these other things. So, so it has to be automated. Okay, but but you can do those things, and and so those are things that don't cost much money, and then it saves on the size of your chiller. It saves on the size of your HVAC system. It saves on everything, and and but I think the ignorance and inertia is 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 a lot of it. What can the government do? They can be the information bearer. They can be the convener. They can be helping invent software tools that help the architects and social engineers automatically say, well, this is kind of what I want conceptually. And so you tell me where I should put the air ducts and how big should they be. And you can tell me how to use passive shading and, and make suggestions. Jeff, anything on buildings? Well, just that uh, this is a difficult issue for the federal government to fix. Uh, I mean, the tradition is that uh, state and local government determines building codes, and that's always been the case. And it's not, I think I've, I've determined in the time I was back there that it's not realistic to think we're going to have federally uh, mandated building codes that have any real teeth in them. Uh, so I do think uh, the federal government's role is, is as Steve des describes it, and that is to try to show the way Try to try to encourage, try to provide incentives uh, for uh, states and and local communities to do the right thing, and for 
uh, builders and architects to do the right thing. Yeah. And when we build federal buildings, hey, you have to let that be an example. We build things in military bases, let that be an example. We're going to turn over now to the audience to ask questions to this, this panel. And there's people with microphones. If you raise your hand, somebody will bring a microphone to you and you can speak. Here we go. Hi, John Mashey. Could, you, could you, you, address, you give us your name first? Yeah, John Mashey. Uh, quick question. I grew up just north of Pittsburgh uh, as well and used to work for the U.S. Bureau of Mines, Pittsburgh Mining Research Center, which sort of watched over the coal guys. Uh, interesting experience. So I have a question about fracking and the potential role of insurance. And the reason was there were a lot of coal mines in western Pennsylvania that were out of use for 20, 30 years. The companies were gone. Uh, they would collapse. They would burn all kinds of stuff. Um, to, to what extent is it possible to either have regulations or involve the insurance industry in making sure that people in an area don't get hurt 20 years later? And therefore give Sh shorter term incentives yeah. to the companies to do it right, engineer the, the wells right, uh, and do the geology right? And that's an excellent question. I'm not sure we have an answer in this panel to that question. I'm going to turn it over to Steve first to see if it's. You... Yeah, that's a great question because there are plenty of examples of mining companies mm -hmm. that do this and then 20, 30 years later, they're belly up. They, they no longer exist, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you get, you know, acid conditions, terrible runoffs, all these things. And, um, and then, uh, you know, ultimately either you, you've got this really polluted site or else the taxpayer has to clean it up. And I, it, we shouldn't be thinking about that. Uh, just as, you know, after the Macondo oil spill, the Gulf of Mexico, um, uh, you know, Transocean was the company hired by BP to do this. But a much smaller company could have done that, which has no assets. And they could have done equal damage, because it, right, it was transition. And, and you, there has to be protection against that. Uh, now, it was suggested by the, oil, the Presidential Oil Spill Commission that everybody who extracts oil out of the Gulf of Mexico pay into a pool, an insurance pool, that, you know, and then depending on how much you're extracting, how much profit you're making, you pay more, you know, so the big guys uh, who are getting a lot of oil should pay more into that, but it allows the smaller people to have this pool of protection. I thought it was a great idea. The company strongly resisted that. Okay, so a similar thing, you know, on all mining operations, uh, you know, in fracking, the, the biggest fear is actually the smaller companies who can do equal environmental damage, pollute a major water table, or have fugitive, runaway fugitive emissions, and uh, they don't have deep pockets. And they just, they don't even go through chapter 11. They just go straight to chapter 7. <laughs> <laughs> and then who's left holding back? The people and the taxpayers. So insurance pools, things like that, to give it more longevity, I don't know. But, but these are some ideas. But amazingly, industries, the, you know, I was thinking this is a great idea for the oil industry to help, help itself, and yet huge resistance. Jeff, do you want to add, add anything to that? Well, just that uh, I, I could also support uh, the kind of uh, establishment of a fund uh, to deal with oil mm -hmm. spills. But uh, I, I really think probably the government's most effective efforts uh, uh, are done at the front end in trying to have effective regulation and monitoring of what's going on. I mean, I think uh, instead of coming along behind and trying to, trying to provide some kind of recompense for, for folks that are injured by inadequate regulation, I think we're better off focusing on, on uh, better regulation and better monitoring of what's happening at the beginning. Next question. Yes, my name is Barry Chen. I'm the Cupertino City Council. Uh, the United States infrastructure ranking is number 25 in the world. Wouldn't the government is going to spend more money in improve the infrastructure, especially the massive public transit to help reduce the CO2? 
to Jeff, do you want to try that? <laughs> well, I, I think it's not likely to happen soon. Uh, we, 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 of course, uh, had a substantial infusion uh, of funds into infrastructure as part of the so-called stimulus uh, bill uh, that, uh, that the Congress passed to try to help us pull out of the recession. Uh, I don't think there's much appetite in Washington uh, to try to do that again right now, particularly given the size of our deficit and given the sentiment uh, of many people that we uh, uh, we need to be uh, shrinking government, not increasing the size of government, and, and certainly there's very little enthusiasm for raising taxes. So, so what you're proposing has some good logic to it, but I don't think you're likely to see a uh, uh, groundswell of support in Washington for uh, substantial additional public spending on infrastructure in the near future. Okay, there's a question over here. Hi, uh, my name is Elliot Hoffman, and I uh, run a company called True Market Solutions. And I have a quick comment and then a quick question. Uh, as of a couple of hours, I was walking through the, the hallway here, and I noticed on this beautiful, bright, sunny day in this beautiful building filled with glass, every single light bulb was on. And there are roughly, I just counted about 60 bulbs in here, plus the side panels. And it's just our behavior is a big part of what we're doing. The question is, is related to a, a, a meeting that I was at a few weeks ago in Napa with people who were focused on climate, energy, and AB32, all focused on California. And there was a professor from Stanford, one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Chu, uh, uh, Mark Jacobson. And I'd be curious as to your thoughts on his, his, uh, his findings along with somebody from UC Berkeley. And that was that they've, they're now saying that in California and New York, and I, I'm not sure about the whole country, that by 2030, we could convert all of our energy to electricity and produce 100% of our electricity with wind, water, and sun power and convert this by 2030, add another 10 or 20 years, who cares? But what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't believe that, but let's see what uh, Steve and Jim, you may want to comment on that one also. Steve, let's start off with yeah, you. Yeah, I think that's uh, op uh, way over optimistic. Um, I think that for uh, airplanes, um, I don't see liquid fuel being replaced uh, in the near future. So then the question is, can you make uh, liquid fuel, renewable liquid fuel, rather than uh, you know, from fossil fuel? That's something that certainly has got a lot of Department of Energy attention, a lot of other people's attention. Um, so while I'm very bullish on, on technology, uh, I think 20 years, was, was it 20 years your number? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, um, uh, I don't see it happening in 20 years. Um, I, 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 we're going to need some point sources of energy just for peaking and other things like that. So, so and for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years at least, just, just for things like that. Um, uh, so, um, yeah. Jim, Jim, do you have a different view on that than Steve? Um, no, I, I think in fact, technically, you might be able to do it if you don't care about the cost, if you don't care about <laughs> the economy, if you don't care about the reliability of the, if you don't care about the reliability of the system, and if for airplanes you have a very long extension cord. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, yes, my name is Richard Hilt, and um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank both Dr. Chu and Senator Bingaman for, for um, bringing up some very interesting technical energy issues and the policy issues, and notwithstanding Dr. Chu's belief that physicists are smarter than economists. Jim, uh, you're, you, you, you had a lot of restraint there. In, in, in the, um, but but I, these, are, these are very complex <laughs> issues, both, both in terms of the technology and in terms of the policy. How do, you, how do you communicate the complexity to the average moak in the street? Effectively. <laughs> First of all, I did not say that physicists were smart in economics. All I was saying is that um, <laughs> 
you might have inferred that. <laughs> what, I, what I was saying was uh, that uh, I would love to dearly have more data-driven stuff and, and spend a lot of time getting valid data that other people can say, where did you get that data? How would you get that data? This is what astrophysicists do with each other and astronomers. They can't do experiments. We don't go start a star and say, OK, now we understand how stars work. Uh, but you get better and better information, and, in, and it eliminates models. It, it refines models. It gets rid of some of the stuff, the underbrush thinking. And so I think Jim and I will both agree that that data-driven stuff and get better at getting data, more reliable data, and the discussion is, is the data reliable? How did you analyze it? All this other stuff. And then start from there. And, and that's really what I was pushing. Uh, so, yeah. And let me comment. We have data-driven physicists, and you have theoretical physicists. You have data-driven economists and theoretical economists. <laughs> and hopefully, each group talks to one another, at least the physicists with the physicists and the economists with the economists. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, string theory guys, um, yeah. since they can't make predictions, uh, they kind of fly off in some deep space. <laughs> and so I'm an experimentalist, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Next question. Uh, my name is Chris Verma. I have been in the Silicon Valley for 35 years in microelectronics industry. Uh, manufacturing part of the microelectronics has gone to Asia, so is the solar panel. The question to Secretary especially, is it really practical to bring those back here now economically? Let me begin. I, I said, can we do it, not should we spend taxpayer money to do it? Huge difference, and I would agree with Jeff. Uh, there's a role and they're not, you know, the proper role of the federal government is one thing and there is not an appetite going for at least for the next five, six years of huge federal dollars going to things. So, so, um, so it, it's, and there was another question that had something to do with this. Most of this stuff has to be private sector driven. It just simply has to be that way. That's the way the U.S. society and markets and everything else work. And so what you should be spent, what we should be spending our time doing is thinking how to tweak things to, to drive private sector investments that make it a good business decision, right? And, and to say we can do this and, not, and ignore the economics is saying, no, we really can't. You know, many times people have come up and said, we can do X. And it, it's only a matter of money and said, well, excuse me, energy is about money, right? You know, a 10% difference in energy costs mean huge things to a lot of people. And, and, and so it's a non starter to say it costs five times as much. So going back to whether we should be bringing solar companies back to the United States, it's got to, you know, first the whole market, but, but unfortunately solar modules ship everywhere in the world now. It's like automobiles. Uh, so, so it's, you know, what are the incentives that are, don't use a lot of taxpayer money to actually get American companies to reinvest in themselves? I go back to steel. What, what should one be doing that doesn't require a lot of taxpayer dollars to get the industry to reinvest in itself? And that's, the, that's the $64 question in my mind. Do we have another question? This, is, this will be the last question, by the way, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jim, final word. Thank you very much. My name is Bobby Kukulis. I have a question about um, federal policy. You talk about um, ways that you guys can change it. One of it is the divestiture of oil companies through the sunsetting of their subsidies. There seems to be a lot of money that goes into IDCs or, or subsidies that are no longer relevant or not nearly as impactful as they could be if applied to renewables or um, other things in the, in the non-carbon or low-carbon energy. Can you talk about that um, and those policies? And you know, Obama talked about re re repealing those. Didn't really get anywhere, but I know he's talking about bringing that back. Um, love to hear about that. Jeff, do you want to add that one? Uh, well, I, I think uh, everyone's talking about doing a major reform of the tax code. Mm -hmm. Clearly, mm -hmm. that should be one of the things that uh, uh, should be looked at uh, as part of that. And the president, of course, is advocate. I think in the budget, the president has sent the Congress for the last several years 
maybe since he's been president, each, each year he has advocated <clears throat> the repeal of those uh, various tax provisions uh, that, uh, uh, that favor the uh, fossil fuel industry, basically. So uh, I, think, uh, I think it's only going to happen as part of a major tax reform. It's not going to happen, happen on a one-off basis. And, uh, and of course, there'll be a lot of fight about whether it happens even in that context. Well, please join me in thanking these two amazing people.